Welcome, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Dr. Morrison, and I'm a hip and knee replacement surgeon and part of the orthopedic department at St. Vincent's Medical Center. Today, I'll be talking about aches and pains around our hips and knees. I'll spend about 30 minutes reviewing the causes, prevention, and treatment of arthritis. Let's start by defining the word arthritis. It's used by clinicians to specifically mean inflammation around the joints. It refers to more than 100 diseases and conditions that affect joints, tissues surrounding the joint, and other connective tissues. The pattern, severity, and location of symptoms vary depending on the type of disease. Typically, these conditions are characterized by pain and stiffness in or around one or more joints. The symptoms can gradually develop or develop suddenly. Certain conditions can also involve the immune system or other internal organs of the body. Here are a list of some of the more common types of arthritis, including rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, septic arthritis, and Lyme arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a long-lasting disease that affects many parts of the body, but mainly the joints. In the disease, the immune system, which normally protects the body, begins to attack the joint lining, causing swelling, pain, and deformity. It can affect large joints like the hip, the knee, or the spine. In some instances, the disease can present in children when it's referred to as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis is typically associated with the skin disease psoriasis, and while it may involve larger joints such as the knees, it often presents with symptoms in smaller joints like the tips of the fingers or toes. A hallmark of this disease is skin changes that occur over the extensor surfaces of the elbow or the knees. Like rheumatoid arthritis, this is a form of an immune system disorder. Post-traumatic arthritis typically results from an injury to the joint surface. If a broken bone or fracture extends into the joint surface, the smooth cartilage within the joint is damaged and becomes uneven, causing friction and eventual breakdown of the joint leading to arthritis. This can sometimes happen despite our best attempts to repair the joint. Septic arthritis is an infection of the joint. Often bacteria can reach the joint through the bloodstream uh, from an infection in another part of the body. Infected joints are typically warm, red, and tender. They're often swollen due to pus within the joint. An infected joint needs surgical drainage in addition to antibiotics. There can be long-term consequences to septic arthritis, including damage to smooth cartilage within the joint leading to arthritis. Lyme arthritis can be one of the many side effects of Lyme disease a systemic infection that's caused by a bacteria transmitted via tick bites. Lyme arthritis can present as pain and swelling in the early stages of the disease and is typically treated with antibiotics. Left untreated, Lyme disease can lead to chronic arthritis. The most common type of arthritis is actually osteoarthritis, primarily of the hips and knees. Also known as wear and tear arthritis, osteoarthritis occurs when the cartilage that cushions and protects the ends of our bones gradually wears away. It results from overuse, trauma, or the natural degeneration of cartilage that occurs with aging. Symptoms of knee osteoarthritis include pain, typically described as a deep ache, swelling, and stiffness that may develop gradually over time, although sudden onset is possible. There are other symptoms as well, including flare-ups with vigorous activities, locking or sticking sensations caused by loose fragments of cartilage or bone, pain causing a feeling of weakness or buckling in the knee, and increased pain with rainy or cold weather. Here you can see a normal knee joint on the left and an arthritic knee joint on the right. Bone growths called spurs or osteophytes develop along the edge of osteoarthritic joints. The bone can become firm and the joint can become inflamed, causing pain and swelling. Degenerative tears of the menisci may occur, leading to some of those previously mentioned mechanical locking or catching symptoms. Continued use of the joint becomes painful. Here are x-rays demonstrating a normal knee on the left and an osteoarthritic knee on the right. 
The radiographic hallmarks of an osteoarthritic knee include loss of joint space, deformity, bone spur formation, or hardening of the bone. Symptoms of hip osteoarthritis may also develop gradually over time or suddenly uh, with vigorous activities. Another characteristic of osteoarthritic pain is stiffness that makes it difficult to bend at the hip and tie one's shoes, and mechanical symptoms that may be due to loose fragments of bone or cartilage that break off within the joint. Decreased range of motion can affect one's ability to walk and can result in a limp. Increased pain is not uncommon with rainy or cold weather. Osteoarthritis causes loss of cartilage that results in narrowed joint space, bone spur formation, and loss of congruity of the ball and socket joint. The labrum which lines the edge of the hip socket can undergo degenerative tearing as well. Here are x-rays demonstrating a normal hip on the left and an osteoarthritic hip on the right. The radiographic hallmarks of an osteoarthritic hip include loss of joint space, loss of congruity, bone spur formation, or hardening of the bone. So how can we prevent arthritis? While arth osteoarthritis is a non-reversible degenerative process, there are some things we can do to prevent it. These include maintaining joint mobility and strength through either a home exercise program or a regimented physical therapy program, injury prevention by safeguarding your home against tripping hazards or using an assisted device, maintaining a healthy weight to reduce stress on your joints, and finally, participating in low impact activity to avoid repetitive injury to your joints. Low impact activity includes cycling, use of an elliptical, or swimming. Now, unfortunately, some risk factors for osteoarthritis are not modifiable. These include age, female gender, and even genetics. This data shows there is an increase in the percentage of patients with osteoarthritis as patient age increases. It also shows that there's a greater percentage of arthritis in females at each age group. It has been suggested that the prevention of arthritis can be achieved through a healthy diet. There is some role for nutritional supplements or nutraceuticals, including vitamin D, vitamin E, turmeric, Mediterranean diet, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, and cannabidiol. Vitamin D deficiency affects about 42% of Americans and is more prevalent in higher latitudes like Connecticut, where people remain indoors more often and lack sunlight exposure necessary to convert vitamin D to its active form. Laboratory studies have demonstrated that vitamin D has a role in decreasing inflammatory response of the immune system and that receptors for vitamin D are increased inside cartilage cells with osteoarthritis. Clinical studies have demonstrated that vitamin D deficiency poses a risk for osteoarthritis, and those patients with decreased cartilage thickness are more likely to be vitamin D deficient. However, the role of vitamin D supplementation in the treatment or prevention of osteoarthritis remains unclear and more research is required. Vitamin E is a naturally occurring antioxidant found in fruits and vegetables and may have a role in the prevention of osteoarthritis. A recent review found 14 studies reported a beneficial relationship, while nine other studies reported only a negligible or negative impact. The authors concluded that while vitamin E may slow the progression of osteoarthritis due to its antioxidant effect, the data to support its role in preventing osteoarthritis is lacking. The bottom line is that more research is needed to understand how to utilize vitamin E to prevent osteoarthritis. So curcumin is a naturally occurring substance that uh, has some anti-inflammatory properties and patients do report some benefit uh, and relief of their symptoms when using curcumin. The problem is that the commercially available supplements that include curcumin are not regulated by a federal body like the FDA. So their dosage is not consistent and the quality is not consistent. So although you may report some relief with use of uh, these uh, herbal supplements, it may not provide you long-lasting relief, and it may be 
uh, an inconsistent composition where you're not getting a uh, full benefit from it, and it can potentially have side effects. So a balanced Mediterranean diet includes several servings of vegetables, whole grains, and olive oils. These are rich in omega fatty three acids, which uh, can prevent inflammation and can contribute to the preservation of cartilage. There have been several studies that looked at uh, the effectiveness of maintaining a healthy Mediterranean diet in patients with arthritis. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to measure that effect. So glucosamine and chondroitin have long been touted as maintenance therapy for hip and knee cartilage, as they are essential building blocks for cartilage. There's been a lot of research looking at how effective it is in maintaining cartilage and preventing the progression of osteoarthritis. One of the biggest studies came out of the New England Journal of Medicine. In this study, they looked at five groups of patients that received many different interventions, including glucosamine and chondroitin. They were looking for a decrease in knee pain in the study population. What they found was that glucosamine or chondroitin, either alone or together, failed to effectively reduce pain compared to a placebo. The study did have some limitations, which opens the door for some potential value in using glucosamine and chondroitin. However, that relationship has yet to be fully understood. Based on this and other compelling studies, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons recommends against the routine use of glucosamine and chondroitin. One issue that comes up frequently in the literature is how inconsistent the composition of these nutraceuticals can be due to the lack of regulation from a body like the FDA. So I advise my patients with moderate to severe osteoarthritis symptoms who take glucosamine and chondroitin that they should make sure it's coming from a reputable source and that they should be aware of some of the side effects of these nutraceuticals, including but not limited to puffy eyes, diarrhea, nausea, gas and bloating, constipation, hair loss, and stomach pain. Another popular nutraceutical is cannabidiol or CBD. This is the non-psychotropic component of marijuana. It's different from medical marijuana in that it doesn't contain THC and it doesn't give the patient a high. It's often extracted from hemp plants rather than marijuana buds. It's available in many forms, including oils, edibles, and creams. There are several studies that have examined postoperative pain and the use of CBD. CBD has been found to relieve some postoperative knee pain following total knee replacement. Now, here is a list of some of the recognized and approved non-surgical treatments for hip and knee osteoarthritis. I'll briefly review each treatment. Specific exercises can help increase hip and knee range of motion, flexibility, in addition to strengthening the muscles around the joints. This helps to stabilize your joints and alleviate some of the symptoms of osteoarthritis. Continuing these exercises daily will help maintain muscle strength and prevent deconditioning. Furthermore, modifying activities to avoid painful motions such as deep squats, stair use, uh, or uh, aggressive exercise is helpful in alleviating symptoms. I often counsel my patients to avoid high impact activities such as running and alternatively recommend exercising with a recumbent bike, elliptical, or swimming. Tylenol is a pain reliever that can be effective in reducing mild arthritis pain, while tramadol is a pain reliever that is a mild narcotic and effective in reducing severe arthritic pain. Stronger narcotics like oxycodone, Vicodin, OxyContin are not generally recommended for the treatment of chronic pain in osteoarthritis due to the potential for addiction. Like all medications, however, pain relievers can cause side effects and interact with other medications you're taking. So be sure to discuss potential side effects with your doctor. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs may relieve pain and reduce inflammation associated with osteoarthritis. Some over-the-counter examples of these medications include Aleve, Motrin, and Advil. Other medications are available by prescription. Older patients with kidney or heart issues and any patients with acid reflux 
should discuss long-term use of these medications with their doctor first. Corticosteroid injections are powerful anti-inflammatory agents that are placed directly into joints to reduce pain and swelling associated with arthritic flares. They are effective in reducing pain for several months. In severe cases of arthritis, however, minimal joint space remains and their effectiveness is limited. Sometimes oral steroids can be prescribed in lieu of injections. However, they can cause side effects outside of the joint, including weight gain, insomnia, or impaired blood sugar or blood pressure control. Some have expressed concerns, however, regarding the safety of steroid injections. In October of 2019, a study out of Boston University made national headlines. In this study, radiologists evaluated x-rays of hips and knees prior to and following corticosteroid injections and concluded that patients with joint pain and mild or limited signs of arthritis on x-rays were at risk for rapid degeneration of the joint. I think its design is somewhat flawed as it's a single center observational study with no control group and it relies solely on x-ray data and not patient symptoms. I am of the belief that we treat patient symptoms and not their x-rays. And lastly, braces are an option for non-surgical treatment. There are multiple types of braces and assisted devices. A hinged knee brace can be helpful for patients complaining of knee instability or giving way. An unloader brace may be helpful for patients with a large correctable deformity in the frontal plane, either a bow-legged or knock-kneed deformity. This brace takes pressure off of the affected side of the knee and transfers it to the less worn portion of the knee. Assisted devices can include walking aids like canes and a walker or tools to help facilitate activities of daily living. In general, we do not recommend sacrificing mobility or independent ambulation. One fairly common treatment for knee osteoarthritis is viscosupplementation. This treatment relies on hyaluronic acid, which is a main component of normal joint fluid. Joint fluid in the knee contains elevated inflammatory inducing molecules, free radicals, and enzymes that impair the function of hyaluronic acid and can contribute to the progression of arthritis. Hyaluronic acid serves as a shock absorber, a lubricant, and has anti-inflammatory and cartilage protecting properties that can restore normal knee function. There are many preparations of visco supplementation available that differ by molecular weight, method of production, half-life, and cost. Most visco supplementations are harvested from rooster combs while others are synthesized in a laboratory. Some are administered over multiple doses while other large volume single dose regimens are available. A 2014 review of 89 studies on over 12,000 patients found visco supplementation, particularly with high molecular weight cross-linked preparations, gave probable pain reduction with low risk complications in younger patients with milder knee osteoarthritis. Stem cells and platelet-rich plasma fall into a broader category of therapies called orthobiologics which are substances that are naturally found in the human body and can be used to improve healing of cartilage, injured muscles, tendons, ligaments, and even fractures. The role in the treatment of osteoarthritis is controversial, mainly due to the lack of evidence. Some examples of orthobiologics include bone marrow aspirate concentration, umbilical cord-derived mesenchymal stem cells, and platelet-rich plasma. Bone marrow aspirate concentrate is obtained through a bone biopsy, often from the hip crest. This can be quite painful. The aspirated bone marrow is separated with a centrifuge and the layer containing stem cells is isolated for injection into the joint. These cells have regenerative potential and can create and differentiate into muscle, bone, or cartilage cells. An alternative to bone marrow aspirate concentration is donor stem cell that is taken from amniotic membranes or umbilical cords. These cells come from younger patients and demonstrate improved proliferation, migration, and secretion of growth factors that promote cartilage repair. These cells can be freeze-dried and reconstituted, minimizing the risks of reaction to donor tissue. In a recent study looking at commercially available mesenchymal stem cells, 
patients with diffuse knee osteoarthritis had significantly improved pain and function compared to the use of visco supplementation. Platelet-rich plasma offers some of the advantages of stem cells without donor site pain or concerns for reaction to donor tissue. Platelet-rich plasma is obtained by drawing whole blood and separating it into its components and injecting the layer containing platelets into the affected joint. Platelet cells are not stem cells, but they do have regenerative potential and can release proteins and growth factors that decrease inflammation and promote cartilage restoration. Keep in mind, however, that the effects of platelet-rich plasma are closely tied to the health of your own platelet cells. Unfortunately, despite their promise, orthobiologics are costly and lack high-quality evidence, so insurance companies rarely pay for them and they can cost up to $500 to $2,000 per treatment. Moving on to surgical treatments. When conservative measures fail, there are several surgical options, including arthroscopy, subchondroplasty, osteotomy, or arthroplasty. Arthroscopy is a minimally invasive approach allowing surgeons to access the joint. While the role of hip arthroscopy is very limited in hip arthritis, it may be of some benefit in patients with abnormal anatomy causing labral tears or early degenerative changes. Knee arthroscopy, on the other hand, can be helpful in osteoarthritis when mechanical symptoms are present. Subchondroplasty is a relatively newer procedure directed at patients with severe pain and mild to moderate degenerative changes on x-rays. The procedure targets painful inflammation in bone marrow beneath the cartilage and reinforces it with cement. Here you can see an MRI of the knee showing inflammation of the bone in white. Using a combination of knee arthroscopy, x-rays, and small incisions, Cement is injected into the corresponding bone to help support the joint and decrease symptoms of arthritis. In a study of 66 patients who underwent knee arthroscopy with subchondroplasty, significant improvements in knee pain and function were noted, as you can see here in blue, and were observed for up to two years postoperatively. The percentage of patients who required a total knee replacement was 20% at one year postoperatively and 30% at two years postoperatively. This study suggests longer lasting relief when arthroscopy is combined with subchondroplasty in appropriate cases, as historically arthroscopy has only been effective in treating knee arthritis symptoms for up to six months. Another joint preserving surgical intervention is an osteotomy. These surgeries correct knee alignment in patients with mild degenerative changes on x-rays to prevent progression of osteoarthritis. Knees in which the mechanical access passes inside the center of the knee are considered to be varus or have a bow-legged deformity, while in knees where the mechanical access passes outside of the center of the knee are considered to be valgus or have a knock-knee deformity. The deformities can be corrected performing a controlled bone break and either opening or closing the bone at the fracture site to correct the alignment prior to holding the bone in place with screws and plates to facilitate healing. These procedures are invasive and require a period of protected weight bearing and generally reserved for younger, more active patients with mild to moderate arthritis in one compartment of the knee. Similar reorientation of the hip joint can be performed, but is generally reserved for patients with abnormal anatomy or hip dysplasia, predisposing them to osteoarthritis. Here you can see under coverage of the ball and socket joint which is corrected by breaking and reorienting the pelvis. Again, this is a very invasive procedure that requires prolonged protected weight bearing after surgery and is generally reserved for younger, more active patients with hip dysplasia. Arthroplasty is a medical term for joint replacement, which stems from arthro for joint and plasty for molding or formation of. Hip and knee replacements are two of the most commonly performed surgeries and are frequently performed for osteoarthritis. In these procedures, the diseased cartilage and bone is removed and replaced with metal, plastic, and sometimes ceramic components. 
In total knee replacement, an incision is made over the front of the knee and the disease cartilage and bone is resected while taking care to preserve the majority of the ligaments that stabilize the knee. Once the cut surfaces are removed from the thigh and shin bones, a metal end cap is placed on the bottom of the thigh bone and a metal plate is placed on top of the shin bone with a plastic liner in between. The undersurface of the kneecap is then resurfaced and the replaced joint functions like a normal hinged knee joint and reproduces the normal anatomy while increasing function and reducing pain. Believe it or not, most patients are up and walking the same day of surgery. The cartilage of the ball and socket joint of the hip normally functions smoothly, allowing full range of motion. In an arthritic hip, the cartilage wears away and bone spurs form, impeding motion, causing pain and stiffness. In total hip replacement, an incision is made over the front, side, or back of the hip. The ball is then dislocated from the socket before removing the diseased ball atop of the thigh bone. The cup or acetabulum is prepared so that a metal socket can be press fit in place. The hip implant consists of a metal shell, a plastic liner, and a metal or ceramic ball with a metal stem. The metal stem is similarly press fit into the thigh bone. The hip is then reduced and normal pain-free motion about the hip is restored. As with total knee replacements, most patients are up and walking the same day of surgery. In recent years, the direct anterior approach for total hip arthroplasty has had increasing popularity due to its muscle sparing, minimally invasive nature. Hip replacements performed from the front are theoretically more stable due to the preservation of soft tissue attachments in the back of the hip. While it is technically demanding, it offers several advantages over posterior or lateral approaches to the hip, including easy assessment of leg lengths and no need for postoperative hip precautions. Several studies have demonstrated improved early recovery after total hip replacement through a direct anterior approach. In this study, when compared to patients who had hips through a lateral approach, patients who had a direct anterior hip replacement were able to return to work sooner, achieve functional independence without a cane or a walker earlier, and required less physical therapy. Another study compared patients who had hips replaced from either the front or the back. In this study, patients with direct anterior total hip replacement had shorter hospital stays, less need for opiate medications, smaller wounds, and improved functional status during the first six weeks after surgery. One drawback to the anterior approach is that it is technically challenging and not all surgeons are trained to perform this type of hip replacement. However, in experienced hands, it can provide excellent long-term results and offers clear early advantages over other approaches to the hip. While there have been many advances to prostheses and techniques of joint replacement, robotic-assisted joint replacement has been one of the most revolutionary advancements. In robotic-assisted surgery, a preoperative CAT scan of your joint is used to design a surgical plan that is customized to your anatomy. Interoperatively, computer sensors are used to detect your anatomy, range of motion, and soft tissue tension. Then a surgeon-guided haptic-assisted robotic arm is used to remove bone within one millimeter or one degree of the plan. This allows for precise placement of components and can be used to minimize soft tissue damage during surgery. I find this to be particularly helpful for younger, more active patients that need precise positioning of the implants to ensure that they last the rest of their lives. It's also a helpful tool for patients with large deformities about their joints. Finally, despite all of the advancements in non-operative and operative treatments for joint pain, many continue to live in pain. A recent study actually found that 90% of Americans with knee arthritis suffered too long before getting a total knee replacement. So I encourage you to seek an orthopedic consultation if you're having the following symptoms pain interfering with your activities of daily living, pain getting dressed, bathing, or going to the restroom, or pain that wakes you up at night.
Thanks for joining this webinar, and I hope you found this video informative. I see patients in our Fairfield and Shelton locations. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thanks.